This is Matt Frigi. Thank you for joining us. I think this is our biggest webcast to date. Last I saw, we had 867 people registered. At a glance through the list, it, it appears we have a higher percentage than usual from within the United States, although we do have participants from quite a few countries, 10, maybe 20 countries. Clearly, we have a much higher percentage of people from healthcare facilities than usual which is no doubt because of the new CMS requirement, which we'll be talking about. Wherever you live and whatever you do, we are glad you have joined us. Welcome. I want to spend most of our time discussing the seven keys to success with water management plans, but we'll first give a brief update on a few guidelines, standards, and regulations. It's really amazing how much has happened in the last two years to accelerate efforts to reduce the risk of Legionella and other waterborne pathogens by far more, I think, than in the previous 20 years combined. It's been about two years since ASHRAE 188 was released. And what was so significant about ASHRAE 188, besides being an ANSI standard, was that it represented agreement, not only about the need and overall strategy for reducing Legionella risk, which is to manage building water systems to minimize Legionella, but about the framework and essential elements of a water management plan. What ASHRAE outlines is consistent with what the World Health Organization had introduced in 2007 and the Veterans Health Administration, the VA, in 2014 and its Directive 1061. ASHRAE 188 has received a lot of support, a lot of attention, and, and is currently recognized as the prominent Legionella document in the United States. Now, I'm not saying everybody likes it. Some don't, not so much for what it contains, but really more for what it does not have in that it provides only a framework rather than prescriptive, detailed procedures to follow. And some people want to see those. But I don't think too many people, if any, dispute the general framework, the, the essential elements that are outlined in ASHRAE 188. Attorneys have said 188 is the primary document by which water management programs or, or a lack thereof will be measured for building owners that are sued by someone who allegedly contracted Legionnaire's disease in their facilities. And, and that was before CMS referenced ASHRAE 188 as a model for water management plans. The CDC has been behind it. They, about a year ago, June of 2016, in their vital signs document, made some pretty strong statements. Building owners and managers should develop and use a water management program. State and local officials should consider changing building and public health codes to include Legionella water management programs. And this may not have gotten as much attention, but this is a very significant statement, I think, from a legal risk standpoint. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice, but I have served as an expert in quite a few, 60-some lawsuits as an expert. And I think this is a significant statement that Legionella water management plans are now an industry standard for large buildings in the United States. That was made about a year ago by the CDC. And since then, in fact, just a couple of months ago, they released an update of their toolkit, which tells how to develop a Legionella water management plan. And they issued a new vital signs document specifically pertaining to healthcare facilities. About five weeks ago, I was in New York City for a meeting with health officials from there and from other U.S. cities and states, as well as Vancouver, Canada. And during the first part of the two-day meeting, which was called a peer exchange, Chris Boyd, who heads the Legionella program for NYC Health, gave some background stories about their regulations and mentioned that they will be updated from time to time based on what DOH deems beneficial. And they will be, I think, pretty soon making handheld devices, the same handheld devices used by their inspectors, available to the facilities that are audited so that those facilities can do a self-audit between DOH inspections. By the way, in that meeting, Chris Boyd gave an analogy about Legionella prevention that I think is brilliant, and I wanted to share it with you. He pointed out that in the U.S. and in many other countries, too, we have a very, very low tolerance for engineering failures. We don't put up with airplanes falling out of the sky, a car maker recently spent around $2 billion 
recalling cars because of an airbag problem that affected, I think, just two or three people. So the risk was extremely low, but it was still deemed unacceptable by the public because of an engineering failure. But he went on to say, although we've had such a low tolerance for engineering failures in general, we've given a pass to cooling towers, allowing them to make so many people sick. Now, of course, he's mentioned cooling towers specifically because that's what the New York City regulations pertain to. But let me be quick to point out before someone from a cooling tower manufacturer sends me a nasty email that, of course, it's not just about cooling towers, right? It's about plumbing systems and decorative fountains and whirlpool spas as well. And it's not just about the design of the product. It's about how it's used, how it's maintained and operated. But the point is that there's this inconsistency that we've put up with for a long time regarding engineering failure between water systems and other types of devices. Now, I know that hospitals have many pathogens to deal with. It's not just Legionella. But the reason Legionella gets so much attention, and rightfully so, is that it is entirely environmental and almost entirely waterborne. So cases of disease are caused essentially by engineering failures, failures in design, operation, or maintenance of water systems. NSF has four pending standards that could affect you. 459 will be for products intended to reduce or mitigate biofilm and plumbing systems. I was told it has a pretty broad scope. It'll cover physical as well as devices related to chemicals. It'll pertain to reduction of biofilm as well as control of biofilm. 376 is about filters. I think the title is actually Mechanical Water Filtration Systems for the reduction of bacteria and fungi for hand washing and showering in healthcare facilities. So it addresses point of use filtration devices and is expected to be released later this year. 453 is uh, supposed to be out pretty soon this fall. It pertains just to cooling tower systems. It will not be an ANSI standard in itself, but will become part of 444, which is earmarked to be an ANSI standard. The one that will probably affect many of you, is 444. It could be what fills in the ASHRAE 188 framework with detailed prescriptive procedures. The title is Prevention of Disease and Injury Associated with Building Water Systems. So it'll cover not just cooling towers, but all building water systems and be fairly broad in in scope. I, I believe that NSF wants to finalize 44, if possible, around a year from now, summer of 2018. Some of you might know that ASHRAE released a position paper on Legionella back in 1998 saying that facilities should manage water systems to minimize Legionella risk. And then a couple of years later, in 2000, it released its guideline 12, which was basically designed to tell them to tell facilities how to do that. The first draft of guideline 12 is being updated now and was just the first draft of that was just released last week for public comment and you have until September 11th to make comments on that if you want to just follow that link. So I think ASHRAE intends for guideline 12 to fill in some of the blanks in 188 with some detailed procedures, the how-to portion. And of course the reason many of you are watching this webcast now is because of the new CMS requirement released early June to avoid a citation for non-compliance with this new requirement, hospitals, nursing homes must demonstrate measures to minimize the risk of Legionnaire's disease. But CMS leaves it almost entirely up to the healthcare facility as to how to accomplish the risk reduction. The memo simply refers to ASHRAE 188 and the CDC toolkit. It outlines a couple of elements that the program must include, but essentially it is an outcome-based or principle-based rule. But it is very important how the facility goes about accomplishing that outcome. It's crucial. And that's what the second part of this webcast is about, the seven keys. Before we get into that, though, let's talk briefly about what might be coming in terms of standards and regulations. And I think a big question is, what's going to fill in the ASHRAE 188 framework? Apparently, there are many people calling for this. They want the details. What are we supposed to do? It could be ASHRAE Guideline 12, the updated version of that. It could be NSF 444. Um, I kind of think it's unlikely that it will be both of those. It's more likely that one of those two will emerge as the dominant document. It could be neither of them, though. Another question is, what will states do? What will states establish? It could be nothing, but I think many states now are looking 
to establish some kinds of regulations pertaining to Legionella. At the meeting I mentioned I attended in New York City a few weeks ago were state and city health officials there primarily because they want to help or push facilities to implement effective water management programs. And they were there to gather information about that, find out what New York City was doing. The states could end up doing nothing, just letting CMS influence the healthcare facilities and hoping that insurance companies influence other types of facilities by requiring preventive efforts in order to maintain their liability policies or to get reduced premiums, something like that. But otherwise, if none of those things happen, history tells us pretty clearly that the percentage of facilities that implement effective water management plans will likely remain pretty low. If several states try to write their own prescriptive regulations, meaning that they come up with their own Legionella control measures and the systems that they cover, I think it'll be a disaster. For one thing, it's hard to do that well, to write something like that that pertains to all facilities everywhere and for all types of water systems and scenarios. But even if they do a good job in writing the regulations, the procedures and so forth, all states obviously are not going to be the same. They're going to come up with different requirements, which will present a nightmare really for owners of properties in multiple states. It'll be so burdensome, the burden of complying with so many different regulations in different states, if you have properties in multiple states, will be so burdensome that ultimately it will be a detriment rather than a benefit to public health because the owners will simply find a way around it or they'll just pay the fines rather than complying with the regulations. They, they almost will have no choice. It'll be, it would be so costly to them. So I hope that doesn't happen. Another option would be principle-based regulations, kind of like what CMS is doing, saying, you know, you need to establish a water management plan. It needs to be effective. And the states could have an online portal into which facilities upload a copy of their water management plan and a PDF. They could require the facility in that online portal to answer certain key questions about their plans to, to make sure they have certain key elements. But otherwise, it would be outcome-based. And I won't go into the differences between principle-based and prescriptive regulations. We talked quite a bit about that in a webcast I did in January. If you want to watch the recording of that, you can do it. Uh, you can see it free on our website, hcinfo.com. What might be, and based on what I've heard, I think what is the most popular option among states is kind of a combination between B and C. To have prescriptive detailed regulations, but instead of writing their own, to base it on a nationally or even globally recognized standard. Maybe NSF 444 will become that standard. One benefit of this option is that the government agency or government entity does not have to produce all of the Legionella control measures, come up with the, you know, outline all those measures, and they don't have to update them either. They just rely on and refer to this nationally recognized standard. Another benefit is that all the states that do it this way would be the same, which would greatly lessen the burden for property owners that have properties in multiple states, allowing them to be consistent from one area to another. Before we discuss the seven keys, I think it's important to define success. What does success look like? And I'm going to offer my opinion that I think it's more than just checking a box to avoid fines and citations. Real success is doing that, but also effectively protecting the people in your buildings, reducing your organization's legal risk, protecting your organization's brand and revenue, and doing all of that without spending more money or time than necessary, without burdening your personnel more than you need to, and without wasting water and chemicals. The first key is a smart hazard analysis. The hazard analysis, first of all, must include the right buildings. Well, let me back up a minute. In case you don't know, let me just mention what a hazard analysis is. So let's say the objective of your water management program is to control Legionella. Now, a good water management program is going to have control measures that minimize the risk of other pathogens as well. But for reasons I won't get into here, it does make sense to have the stated scope of your plan limited to Legionella. So let's say that's how it is. Then the hazard analysis boils down to identifying which water systems on your campus present a significant risk of Legionella growth and transmission, and which ones offer the opportunity to reduce risk by applying control measures at those locations. So the first key is to make the right determination in that regard, which water systems, which buildings. If you miss systems or miss buildings, 
if you don't identify them as include them in your plan and uh, apply Legionella control measures to them, you'll miss opportunities to prevent disease and you'll increase your legal risk. If you include ones you don't need to, then you'll waste money and maybe waste time and chemicals and water as well. And some of the some of the mistakes I see commonly, one of them, is selecting buildings or systems based on Legionella test results. That really is is backwards. You want to use Legionella testing to validate what you are doing, not to decide whether you're going to have a plan or not. And that's why ASHRAE 188 bases water management plan requirements on the types of water systems and regardless of Legionella test results. So let's say you have 20 hotels located in many different areas. And you say, well, we're going to test them all for Legionella. And the ones that have unacceptable results, whatever you define as unacceptable, we're going to have water management programs for those, but not for the other ones. That's a big mistake. Another mistake is excluding domestic cold water systems, in part because those supply water to water heaters. They supply water to ice machines and showers and faucets that people are are exposed to. And some of them aren't, aren't even that cold to begin with, at least during certain months of the year. The other thing, too, about the domestic cold water system is is it has some very important components, like the feeds that come into the building and crossover lines, and large sections of your piping that are crucial to manage to reduce risk. If you exclude the entire domestic cold water system from your plan, you're really missing opportunities to prevent risk at a pretty low cost as well. Another um, important part of the hazard analysis is to be consistent, consistent among properties, consistent for like kinds of equipment and and systems. Going back to the 20 hotels located in different areas, you want to do the same things basically at each one for like kinds of equipment and systems, even if some hotels are located in states that are regulated and other ones are not. You want to be consistent in how you maintain your water heaters, your cold water storage tanks, your whirlpool spas, and so forth. It's very important. Control measures are the most important part of a water management plan because what you do to your water is what actually reduces the risk of disease. One key factor with control measures is to make sure they're comprehensive. And this is kind of hard to figure out because you may not be able to see what you're missing in your plan. You know, it's it, you can evaluate what's there, but you may not know what you don't know or what's not there. And this is what I see as a big mistake with control measures is that they're just not comprehensive. Facilities omit measures that really don't even cost anything, very little to implement, but are really crucial for minimizing risk. And part of being comprehensive is to include all of the water systems you should include. That goes back to key number one with the hazard analysis. You also want to make sure to have measures for design and construction, as well as operation and maintenance. We have a quite a few, I think 40 or so, control measures in LAMPS water management plans just for design and construction. It's hugely important, especially since so many outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease have been associated with those events. And getting it right in the design can save you a lot of trouble and money down the road as well. The control measures need to be specific. If you have measures that are, you know, reduce stagnation or remove dead legs. That's too vague. They need to be specific. Open this valve on these types of lines for at least one minute once a month. A good way to look at it is a maintenance person should be able to look at that control measure and go do it. So they need to be specific. But you don't want to have control measures you don't need because you end up wasting money and time and and resources on those. ASHRAE requires for each control measure to have a limit, a performance limit, and then a procedure for monitoring to find out if that limit is being met. And if it's not being met, then corrective actions to take. And those are very important details, not only the control measures you have, but what do you establish as the limits and the monitoring procedure and the corrective actions for each of those measures? Very important. Training is key number three. The people who are doing your control measures need to know how to do them well. And if they know why to do them, it's even better, right? Most of us are like that. We, we need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Find the combination that works best for you. It's not, it's not going to be the same for every organization. Classroom training, of course, has its benefits when people get together, but it's costly, especially if not everybody is located in the same city. It is limited in terms of the amount of content you can cover in a given period of time. The walkthroughs I've found to be very effective. I've done a number of these 
lately with our water management plan partners, which are companies like water treatment companies, engineering firms, consulting and industrial hygiene firms that use our LAMP software and, and do site surveys for their customers and provide water management plans. So I, I have done some of these to train them and they're very effective, but, but it's limited to you know five people at a time and to a limited scope of content as well. Online courses can be very good as they require a little bit of self-discipline for an individual to go through them, but you can cover a lot more content in a given period of time than you can in classroom training. I've done all of these and I've even back, I think our first two day seminar was in 2001 for Legion LLS. I've tried these methods. The online courses, you can, you can cover so much more in a short period of time. They're very low cost, especially since you don't have to travel to use them. They're on the schedule of the student to do 24-7 whenever they can, whatever they can get to it. What we have found here at HCFO to be especially effective and what we've had very positive feedback on is built-in training. So training built into the control measures in your plan, not actually part of your plan. You don't want to do that from a legal risk standpoint. You want to keep it separate but connected to it. So it's available right when you want it for the people who need it, and it's inexpensive. So here as an example is a screenshot of one of the control measures in LAMPS. It's not the entire thing, but just a few of the fields. And this one is for um, crossover lines. This suggested training field has a couple of links. C327 is an, is an online course pertaining to stagnation, kind of the general subject related to this control measure. But if you click on 4.27, it brings up an article with a diagram on crossover lines. So if you don't know what crossover lines are, you can look at this. It'll tell you why they are a problem with respect to Legionella and why we have included this control measure to minimize risk. Smart execution is key number four. Two facilities with essentially the same content in their water management plans can have very different outcomes. One of the keys is striking the right balance between your in-house personnel, what you do yourself, and what you hire out to vendors. If facilities that try to do everything themselves, including writing their water management plan, fail, I've never seen one that's worked. Their plans end up too vague, too shallow, and indefensible. But most facilities don't try to do that. Most facilities, of anything, do just the opposite. They try to do nothing themselves. They want their vendors to do everything. But that doesn't work either because many of the control measures are going to be better performed by your in-house staff. And so in order to do a good job with your control measures and to control costs, you need to strike the right balance between what you do yourself and what you have outside vendors do. And a lot of this is just smart management. It really just boils down to how good you are at management. Communication is very important. You need to be vigilant in managing construction projects, plumbing projects in particular, it all needs to be well managed too. So it's sustainable. The objective is to keep going. It's not just to set up a plan, it's to implement it and to keep implementing it. So you want a comprehensive and effective program, but sustainable with the personnel and the money that you have. And that takes good management. The best example I can give is UC San Francisco Medical Center. About a year ago, less than a year ago, I interviewed the facilities director, infection control director, and risk management director at UCF in a webcast because they have executed their water management plan so extraordinarily well. Their success could be for several reasons, but two stood out in the interview. For one, they work hard at communication. They schedule regular conference calls. They get all the parties needed in those calls, not only their in-house departments, but outside vendors as well. They plan and they vigilantly monitor plumbing projects. They plan them thoroughly to minimize stagnation, to avoid biofilm disruption and and exposure to patients as a result of what does have to get disrupted during those projects. So I would, if you're a user in LAMPS, I would encourage you to watch the video of that interview. Just go to the video section and training content, click on V28. The fifth key is smart documentation. Documentation obviously is important because From a legal standpoint, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. You have to have evidence for what you did and when. But besides that, it leads to better performance. I mean, a lot of things are like that, right? If we write down our performance, whether we're trying to get you know, stronger, we'll write down uh, our performance for weightlifting. 
I have a son who's a CrossFit coach and was training in Olympic weightlifting, and he would always record, you know, his personal best in each category. It leads to better performance. There are lots of ways to do it, several ways you can do it. It's not that one way is better than another, but you need to have one hub that directs you to the documentation for each control measure. So a control measure might be documented by your facility maintenance software. It might be documented by a log that you have filled out on paper and then scanned into a PDF. It might be a vendor's report, but you want to have one hub. And here's a screenshot from that same control measure in LAMPS. And you can see that in the documentation field, I mean, this is the hub in LAMPS water management plan. So you could put your documentation right in that field saying, well, we flushed the line on these dates, or you could refer to your facility work order software or a PDF that's uploaded and, and you want to describe exactly where that's uploaded. Number six is smart validation. Water management plans have to be validated to show they are effective in accomplishing the objective. And let's say that objective is to control Legionella, then you have to have validation procedures to show that your plan is effective in controlling Legionella. Testing for Legionella provides the most direct feedback on Legionella control. There's no surrogate organism. Testing for total bacteria counts will not tell you about Legionella in your plumbing systems or cooling towers. You need to test for Legionella to know that. So if you're going to do that, though, the only way to make it work well is to do it well. You have to sample enough. I'm talking about Legionella testing here. You have to sample enough. If you sample too much, you're going to spend more money than you need to. If you don't collect enough samples, you won't have enough data on which to base good decisions. So really anything you spend on sampling in that case is a waste of money. So you need to plan samples very strategically so that you can maximize the information for the money you spend pre versus post flush, hot versus cold in a domestic water system, which locations, faucets, showers, swab, water. Very important decisions with all those. And it's not going to be the same necessarily each sampling round. Each one might require different questions to be answered and therefore different samples. You need to collect samples properly. It's not that complicated to fill a bottle with water, but the details are very important. A mistake I see a lot is inadequate data recorded. You need to come up with a way to maximize the useful data because that will make the most of what you spend on those Legionella tests. Use a proven laboratory. This is not an area to skimp. Not to say necessarily that the most expensive laboratories are the best, but make sure you use one that is very reliable, certainly CDC Elite certified, but has a lot of experience and focus with Legionella testing. And here's where I think the biggest problem is now in Legionella testing and perhaps in Legionella prevention altogether, and that is inadequate interpretation of Legionella results. Most people, including not just facility operators, but even industrial hygienists, are taking a very myopic view of it, a simplistic view, using just a simple grid to say, well, above this concentration, we're going to take action. And below this concentration, we're going to do nothing. If you do that, if you try to test for the wrong reasons. For one thing, if you're trying to answer the wrong questions, will someone get sick? Should we do something? You're ultimately going to end up missing opportunities to prevent disease, or you're going to waste money on overkill responses to your test results. A lot of people say, well, we'll just, we did, they just keep retesting, hoping the results get better. And they don't take any action other than doing nothing or disinfecting the entire system. I'm talking specifically about domestic water, potable water, plumbing systems now. And in some cases, they do a combination or, or all of the above. Instead, ask, what do the results suggest about managing our water systems to reduce Legionella risk? And use comprehensive analytics to find the answers to those questions. If you do that, you'll be more likely to prevent disease, to solve problems faster, and to spend less money doing it. Maybe the best way to explain it is to go on to key number seven and just describe what I mean there. If you test for Legionella and you get your results, you don't want to look just at average concentrations or concentrations per sample, like colony forming units per milliliter. And you don't want to look just at positivity, in my opinion. And there's also a, a literature review that was published about three or four years ago in American Journal of Infection Control about this, how you need to look at both. I was a peer reviewer on that article, so I reviewed it very thoroughly. You need to look at both. Positivity, which is percentage of samples in a plumbing system 
in which Legionella is found, the percentage of samples uh, Legionella positive. You want to look at both, but also take a look at your control measures. How are you doing with your control measures? How many are okay? This is a chart from LAMPS based on control measure verification. How many are okay or overdue or due soon? Or in this case, you can see 20% have not even been entered. But then not only looking at overall concentrations and positivity, but how does it compare from one building to another? How does it compare hot versus cold versus hot, cold mixed water, meaning electronic faucets that automatically mix hot and cold water? Something that I have found to be especially effective is to look at the results for specific devices. Now, before we had these analytics in LAMPS, I had to do this in spreadsheets and pour back through maybe 10 or so sampling rounds to find these the answers to these questions for the um, facilities for which I was doing consulting. But in this case, you can see that this hospital hospital has Legionella associated with shower hoses, but not with shower heads. Let's say they have a continuous disinfection system. Instead of just increasing the dosage of chemicals, which they may not be able to do anyway and stay within EPA requirements, they would simply realize, well, we probably need to change those shower hoses more frequently than we are. I found this to be a case in one of the hospitals I was consulting for is that the piped in water dispensers were a problem. I didn't realize that it didn't pop out with the test results until I went back, I think it was 13 sampling rounds going through spreadsheets and realized the positivity was so much higher for these than all the other devices. They already had continuous disinfection for their cold water, but the answer was not increasing the dosage of the chemicals. It was replacing these piped in water dispensers. And we tested then a new type of dispenser up against the old one, side-by-side -side comparisons, and found the new type had essentially 0% Legionella positivity. The old one continued to have 80, even 100% per sampling round. So it was an easy decision, but it required analytics like this to do it. So it's important to find the problems quickly, to save money, to solve the root of the problems, to use good analytics and a very thorough analysis of Legionella test results. I can't seem to get rid of these highlights here. Anyway, so it's not just about Legionella test results too. When you get results like that, you could go and look at your temperature readings. We have these temperature analytics now in LAMPS. So you can check one building to another. Now you can see these are pretty consistent. They're not getting much heat gain between the cold water temperature at the point of entry and the point of use, and they're pretty consistent among buildings. But let's say the North Tower had, instead of this 6291, let's say it was 80. Well, there's something going on there. There's crossover, hot to cold water at a janitor sink or a bedpan washer. And so you can find those problems and deal with them. Comparing building hot and cold water temperature. Same thing with hot water. The temperature leaving the heater versus what you're finding at the points of use. Are you getting more heat loss in some systems than in others? So you can find crossover or other problems associated with that chlorine results as well. So if you test the chlorine of the water coming into the building, you can see what you're getting at the point of entry versus the points of use. So you can see with the south tower, there's a big difference compared to the other buildings. So there's something going on there, something that's causing an increased organic load. So instead of just throwing more chemicals at it, you solve the root of the problem, and then your chemical disinfection, if that's needed, will be more effective. I mean, obviously, we're, we can't go into a full presentation on remediation, but I'm just pointing out here that smart remediation is a key. It's a very important key to a successful water management program. You can track your progress, too, and see how you're doing with your legionella test results for cooling towers as well as domestic water. Water management programs, then, they can really work. You can do this. You can prevent disease with a reasonable budget, take some work up front to get it right. It takes some attention and work on going to execute it well, but you can do it and you can do it at a reasonable cost. I think these seven keys are really important to success. And with that, let's go to questions and comments. If you haven't already, you can enter a question privately in the webinar question box. You can enter a comment publicly on our website. I think by now Christine would have put the um, URL to that page if you don't already have it into the webinar chat. If you are watching the recording of this webinar after the event, you should see uh, the comments box below the video and below at the, ver the article at the very bottom. In any case, I hope you will enter a comment. I hope the webcast has been helpful to you. I appreciate your time and attention and your comments. Thank you. God bless you. I'll see you next time.